Good morning and welcome to worship at Bethany this beautiful Sunday morning. It is turning colder out there and so wherever you are today, I hope that you are surrounded with warmth uh, and safety, that you are also with those you love most and that you uh, find yourself this day filled with faith, hope, and a sense of joy in our time together as we worship Christ, uh, even though we cannot be together in, in this space. We are together in heart, we are together in faith, we are together in prayer, we are together in worship, and I'm glad that you're here. Before we begin our service, I do want to uh, bring to your attention just a couple announcements. Uh, first is a reminder that we have a member, George Pierce, who is turning 100 years old this week. His birthday is actually on the 19th. Um, if you would like, we are hoping to just shower him with cards. And the best way to do that is to mail your card to his wife, Dorothy. If you need the address, you can feel free to call the office here at Bethany and we can give that to you. Or we are also doing a drive-by birthday greeting parade on Wednesday, which is the 18th, the day before his birthday, um, meet here in the Bethany parking lot at 1.15 if you would like to take part. And we will drive over together and uh, we do need to stay in our vehicles and keep moving, but we can still show an awful lot of joy and love and appreciation and celebrate this huge milestone with, with Mr. Pierce. Um, he is one of a kind, as you all know, and this is this is a day of, of uh, a day to celebrate. The second announcement is that next Sunday, uh, which is the 22nd, we are having our next community drive-through free dinner, <laughs> beginning at three o'clock. You can swing through the Bethany parking lot. Uh, we're serving up spaghetti and all of the fixings. Take some for your own household, take some to a neighbor, invite your neighbors to come through. COVID precautions are in place, and so you can be assured that uh, everything will be, you will be safe. But uh, we do want to still be together as a community. And if you want to sit in the parking lot for a little while and wave at, at your neighbors as they pass through, that is a, uh, a fine thing to do as well. Again, even though we need to be physically distanced in this time, we can still be together in community. And I do want to remind you, when you are able, please stay home. And when you need to go out, do so safely. Wear a mask, take your hand sanitizer, wash your hands as frequently as you can, keep your hands away from your face, keep socially distanced even when you're wearing a mask. When possible, meet with others outdoors, the coronavirus numbers in Wisconsin and in Juneau County keep climbing, and it really does take each and every one of us doing our part to bring those numbers down to where it's safe for us to be in worship again. So uh, as we look out for one another, as we look out for those who are most vulnerable in our community, it takes all of us uh, doing what we can do to help keep one another safe. So thank you for what you are doing. Again, I am glad that you are here uh, in worship with us. And this week, we have some powerful words to, to wrestle with in worship. Our readings this whole November have been, and, and next week too, will continue to focus on the end times. Uh, we hear from the prophet Zephaniah this week, who proclaims the coming day of the Lord and describes it as a day that will be filled with wrath and distress and darkness. Paul, in, in his letter to the, the, his first letter to the church at Thessalonica, says that it's going to come like a thief in the night. And he urges us to stay awake and be sober so that we're ready. And in our, from the Gospel of Matthew, we hear Jesus telling the parable of the talents calling us to use our gifts while we still have time for the greater and common good. 
And in our world, in this time that's so filled with violence and despair, fear and anxiety, we gather together around the signs of hope that come to us from Christ, from around the word of God, around bread and wine. And, and in those places, we see Christ coming among us. We see Christ's good news, and we hear Christ calling us to live in the world as it could be, as it should be, instead of how it is. We hear from Christ a glimpse of what is possible when the reign of God, when the reign of Christ uh, really is lived, really is at hand. And so I invite you into this time of worship. Take a deep breath, set aside the distractions, and know that you are held in the loving arms of God. We gather in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome to worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, in whose image we are made, who claims us and calls us beloved. Amen. Holy One, we confess that we are not awake for you. We are not faithful in using your gifts we forget the least of our siblings. We do not see your beautiful image in one another. We are infected by sin that divides your beloved community. Open our hearts to your coming. Open our eyes to see you in our neighbor. Open our hands to serve your creation. Amen. Beloved, we are God's children, and Jesus, our beloved, opens the door to us. Through Jesus, you are forgiven. By Jesus, you are welcome. In Jesus, you are called to rejoice. Let us live in the promises prepared for us from the foundation of the world. Amen.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all and also with you. Let us pray. Righteous God, our merciful master, you own the earth and all its peoples and you give us all that we have. Inspire us to serve you with justice and wisdom and prepare for us the joy of the day of your coming. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading is from Zephaniah chapter 1. Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated his guests. At that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the people who rest complacently on their dregs. Those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do harm. Their wealth shall be plundered and their houses laid waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The warrior cries aloud there, that day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. I will bring such distress upon people that they shall walk like the blind. Because they have sinned against the Lord, their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. In the fire of his passion, the whole earth shall be consumed for a full, a terrible end he will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, Psalm 90 speaks of God being an ancient God, our living place, the place where we dwell for generations, not just us, but lives before us, like maybe our parents, grandparents, people we've never met that go way back, even into the Older Testament, stories of God's covenant love that sustain us. Psalm 90 speaks of you and me as people of the earth, of soil people, dust people and God breathing into us the breath of life and knowing our mortality we can pray God keep us numbering our days so that we might be wise open now our hearts to wisdom keep us numbering our days Generations long behind us Honored you their dwelling place As a blink our life's duration Just a dream of yesterday Dust to dust our lovely lifetimes Age to age your perfect grace children of our planet we will all be quickly gone though we thrive with breath and heartbeat we can never know how long open now our hearts to wisdom keep us numbering our deeds gladly mindful of eternity let us live our holy peace. You have been our sanctuary, faithful God from age to age. Open now our hearts to wisdom, keep us numbering our days. 
you a haven for our forebears with the promise of your grace of our lives god make a legacy of our children's children's faith The second reading is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So then let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other, as indeed you are doing. Word of God word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, For it is as if a man, going on a journey, summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five th talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents with him, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. The one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And on my return, I would have received what was my own with interest. 
So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Having just heard the parable from Jesus, I invite you into another telling of this story, this one by the Reverend Dr. Leah Shade. And much of this sermon actually is indebted to her. Eddie, Freddie, and Javon were summoned into their boss's plush office. They knew that the boss was leaving on an international business trip for several months, 
And so they each sat perched on the soft leather chairs spaced around the big mahogany desk. And the boss, sitting high above them, looked down upon his protégés, Eddie. Eddie was shrewd and cunning. He'd been with the company for a long time. He'd proved his ability with several really shady but profitable real estate schemes, and he was slicker than oil on a snake's back. The boss knew he could always count on Eddie to do everything in his power to increase wealth. So he gave Eddie five million dollars. Freddie, now Freddie was more of a newcomer, so he hadn't had time to fully demonstrate his skills, but he showed potential. So the boss gave him two million dollars. Then there was Javon. Javon was an underperformer at the company. The boss had plucked him out of the hood and taught him all his best tricks for gaining the trusts of the aunties, the Medeas, the Mimas, the grandmas, convincing them to give their money to him to invest for them, and then skipping town with their hard-earned cash. He had showed some promise. He'd, he'd made some strides. But lately, Javon seemed conflicted or distracted or something. He was not bringing in the money the way he should. So the boss gave him one million. No sooner had the boss's private jet left the runway than Eddie and Freddie were off and running. They wheeled and they dealed, they schemed and they scandaled, and it was not long before they had graphed and grifted and grabbed the money out of every sucker they could find. Their offshore accounts grew steadily. Meanwhile, Javon took his million dollars and put it in a safe deposit box at the bank. He couldn't do it anymore. He couldn't play these games with people's money, with their trust. He couldn't betray people, especially his people. He knew how hard People worked to earn the little they had. How could he steal it from them? Eddie and Freddie laughed at him, called him soft. The boss is going to skin you alive, they warned him. But Javon would rather risk the wrath of the boss than put one more widow into foreclosure. Six months later, Eddie, Freddie, and Javon found themselves back in their boss's office. The boss flipped open the laptop to view the accounts of all three protégés. Boss, said Eddie, you gave me a million dollars. Check it out. I doubled it. Now you have ten million. I doubled your money too, said Freddie. You gave me two million. Look, just last week I cleared a cold four million. Ha! Ah. A slow grin grew across the boss's face. He pushed the button on his desk and a door behind him swung wide open and the smell of steak and shrimp scampi and warm bread and wine wafted into the room. Boys, he growled, you have done well. Go take a seat in my private dining room. Eddie, you first. Then the boss looked at Javon's account, empty, and his brow furrowed and his eyes narrowed. Why, yo no good double-crossing. Wait, 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 said Javon. And he pulled a briefcase from under his chair and set it on the desk, clicked it open, and there in the case were neatly stacked bundles of hundred-dollar bills. I can't do this anymore, boss. I'm not doing your dirty work for you and your cheating people. I can't cheat my people. I'm done with this racket you've got going on here. Here's the money you gave me. No more, no less. Take what's yours. 
nostrils flaring like a bull ready to charge, the boss narrowed his eyes at Javon. You worthless dog. You came from nothing and I gave you everything. I set you up to have it all, but you're worthless. I should have known not to waste my time on your kind. You're done. I want every stitch of clothing on your body. Drop it right here because it's all mine. And you will leave here with nothing. You understand? Nothing. When we hear the parable told that way, it makes you wonder about all of those sermons where this was the stewardship text, doesn't it? All of those stewardship campaigns that culminated in this day, reminding you that you to whom much is given, much is expected. To give of the gifts that you have, of all that's been entrusted to you. I know, I know. We're used to using this parable in that way. And yes, there is an eschatological quality to this parable that is right in line with the parable of the 10 bridesmaids that we heard last week and the sheep and the goats that come next week. And this really could be Matthew's way of urging the church to do the good that it can do in preparation for Christ's return. But if we keep following that logic, we run to some really troubling places. And I've actually heard this parable talked about in counseling sessions with members of churches before. Members who really struggled with, how do I know that I'm doing enough? When is enough? I can always give more. I can always do more. But doesn't God want abundant life for us too? And, and the idea of being cast into the outer darkness if you haven't met whatever threshold it is that God has set for you, it's a terrifying idea. And it really slips into a prosperity gospel, right? If I give enough and do enough, God will bless me. If I think the right way and act the right way and pray the right way, then God will bless me. And if not, I'll be punished. That is a heresy that we cannot and should not slip into. There is no good news in that gospel. And even worse, think of how we depict God if that is how we present God in, in this parable. If we see God as the businessman, what kind of God is that? A harsh taskmaster? Stealing, or at least muscling out of others what he wants, reaping where he does not sow, gathering what he does not scatter? Is the master God? Or are we looking for God in the wrong place when we assign him that role? In Jesus' time, in the ancient world, the way to double your wealth was to engage in predatory lending, making loans to people who put up their land as collateral and then seizing the assets when they couldn't pay. Rather than praising wealth accumulation, this parable serves to peel back the glamour of the rich and famous to show their greed and malice the dark side of those that we often put on a pedestal. If this, case, if this is the case, then maybe the parable of the talents is not prescriptive, describing what is to happen, but is rather descriptive, describing the world that we already live in. For those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, what they have will be taken away. Let's tell the truth. That's the world that we live in. That's the capitalist system. And maybe this parable is not saying, 
you'll be rewarded for assenting to and taking advantage of a system that's built by economic privilege, maybe instead it's telling us what happens when Jesus' followers refuse to participate in that system. When they instead step away. Perhaps this parable is warning Jesus' disciples. There are consequences for defying the system. Be aware that this is what will happen when you engage in subversive non-compliance with a harsh, predatory system built on privilege. And if we read the parable of the talents through the lens of race and privilege and wealth in America, we see an even clearer unveiling. The white colonial economy is exemplified by the master and the first two servants. Wealth is conferred on those in the majority with the expectation that they will use any means necessary to increase their wealth. And just like servant three, people of color receive the dregs right from the beginning because they are des designated as having less ability. In this parable, Javan never stole anything. He simply gives back to the harsh, unscrupulous master only what he was given. No more, no less. And for this, he's called wicked, lazy, worthless. Labels that you have probably heard thrown around to many minorities, whether earned or not. And so we have to ask ourselves some questions. What might this parable look like through the eyes of servant three, the eyes of Javan? What might he tell us about the master and what he's witnessed in his time working for the company? What was it like to watch a wealthy man reap what he did not sow and gather where he did not plant seed? How did it feel to be given less than the other two servants, to be judged as having less ability? What was it like for servant three to watch the others swindle, cheat, lie, and take advantage of others for a long time, maybe even people that looked like servant three. And so he faced a moral dilemma, assent to a pyramid scheme or practice subversive non-compliance by burying the talent in the ground and giving it back to the master like the dirty money it was from the beginning. The, boss, the Christ figure in this parable is not the boss behind the mahogany desk. The Christ figure in this story is Javan. Through the voice of servant three, Jesus names the cruelty of this order and shows how it can be unveiled by marginal characters who resist, who undermine, who whistleblow. Is not Jesus rejected by the imperialist, predatory system that he tried to subvert by giving out free bread to thousands of hungry people, by overturning the money changers' tables and driving them out of the temple? Is Jesus not thrown into the outer darkness of Calvary for challenging exactly this kind of economy? parable reveals the ways of empire that are too often invisible because they're taken as normal, natural, good, maybe even the only way. Like Eddie and Freddie, rewarded for their part, for playing their role in this, in this, in this economy. Sometimes Christ is hidden in plain sight. Usually Christ is hidden in plain sight. And so servant three might very well be the Christ figure in the parable of the talents. 
Why do I say that? Because if we look ahead to next week and the parable of the sheep and goats, the talents are read in conjunction with the sheep and goats. You remember where those who had served others are, are at God's right hand and those who didn't are at the left, the sheep and the goats. The sheep receive their reward and the ghosts are, goats are cast into the outer darkness. Only when those who are cast into the outer darkness are ministered to by the sheep is there any restoration, is there any healing, is there any hope. And that's where the identity of Jesus is revealed. And you know that servant three would be with those who were served by the sheep. He had nothing at the beginning of the parable and he had nothing at the end. He was derided, rejected, ejected, like Jesus was derided, ejected, rejected. The parable of the talents tells us that non-compliance is the only logical response if we are to attend to the gospel's message. And the parable of the sheets and goats tells us that caring for the vulnerable, honoring our neighbors, protecting the weak, and restoring dignity and a sustainable community is the antidote to the reality in which we currently live. So what's the church's role in this? Can we be a church that engages the difficult but necessary conversations about what it means to be living in a twisted economy? that rewards greed and privilege and taking unfair advantage of others? How might we, the church, function as a place that invites dialogue about these issues, about how brutal and cruel our economic system and the realities of race, wealth, and privilege are in the lives of real people? Maybe this parable isn't showing us how to structure our society and treat others. Maybe it's telling us how not to structure our society, how not to treat others so harshly with greed, with insults, with final judgment. Maybe Javon, maybe Servant 3 embodies values that we could, that we should, Try to embrace defiant non-compliance when things are unjust, when things are immoral. Telling the truth boldly, bravely. Accepting with courage the consequences of, of refusing to participate in a system that exploits others. Next week, we'll move into that parable of the sheep and the goats, and then we'll be asking how we can model basic decency and compassion, care for the vulnerable, honoring our neighbors, protecting the weak, ministering to those who have decided to step away from abusive, corrupt, and racist systems. That parable is going to show us that ultimately there's a power that is greater than any destructive ego that's more effective than violence can ever be, that's more lasting than any labels or names or hate that we can spew at one another. And that's the power of generosity, creativity, joy, acceptance, peace, invitation, love, welcome. Let there be no doubt the master, Eddie, Freddie, they are goats, and they will be judged by the king. But the sheep, the sheep will find Javon, and they will listen to Javon. They will believe Javon. They will honor Javon's humanity and courage. The sheep will be with Javon. And then, surprise! surprise, the sheep will find that all along they've been with Christ. 
Amen. Longing for Christ's reign to come among us, let us pray to see God's power in the church and in the world, responding to each petition with the words, hear us and help us. We pray, O oh God, for the church in our community and throughout the world. Raise up and sustain believers who will use their talents to assist in worship to lead congregational ministries, even in this difficult time. Shower upon Bethany Lutheran Church the power of your spirit and protect your people with the armor of your word. O oh God, you are the temple of your people. Hear us and help us. For the earth, we pray, during this autumn season, give to the plants and wild animals a season of rest. O oh God, you are the maker of heavens and the earth. Hear us and help us. For all the nations, we pray, bring an end to war and terrorism, 
cultivate a worldwide spirit of cooperation that will seek just agreement and shared human rights and dignity, rescue humankind from the worship of wealth, and give a homeland to migrants. O oh God, you are the haven we seek. Hear us and help us. We pray for all who are in need. Visit with health and good medical care all who are sick, especially the thousands who each day are battling coronavirus. Prepare a vaccine to save our world from COVID-19. Give food, employment, and housing to the countless who are struggling to live. We pray especially for those we name to you now. O oh God, you are our physician, our nurse. Hear us and help us. For many of us, what the ancient prophet said is now true. These are days of distress and anguish. We beg you to listen to the prayers of our hearts. O oh God, you are father, mother, master, friend. Hear us and help us. We remember before you all the saints who have lived and died in the faith, especially those we name now. At the end of time, gather us all into your unending peace. O oh God, you are the light perpetual. Hear us and help us. Receive these prayers, and in your grace, gracious mercy, grant your strength to our neediness. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And may the peace of Christ be with you always. Please take a moment to greet one another with words of peace. If you'd like, mark the sign of the cross on one another's forehead reminding each other that you are God's beloved child and God will never, ever let you go. This is also the time in our service when we would usually gather our offering. I invite you to consider the gifts and offerings that you would like to share with us, including Bethany in, uh, in your gifts. Without you, our ministry could not continue, and it does continue on. And so I am so grateful for your faithful giving, your faithful participation, your faithfulness in prayer, your faithfulness in using your talents to serve Christ in our neighbors. For that, I am truly grateful. Thank you. Uh, we will now sing... Be glorified as our offering him.
received our offerings, let us pray. God of all goodness, generations have turned to you, gathered around your table and shared your abundant blessings. Number us among them, that as we gather these gifts from your abundance and give thanks for your rich blessings, we may feast upon your very self and care for all that you have made. Through Jesus Christ, our sovereign and servant. Amen. And now we prepare for communion. I hope that you have gathered bread and wine or juice, whatever it is that you have at hand to share, that you have appointed someone to be the leader in your home. Leaders, as I raise the elements, I invite you to raise them up with me as we remember that the table here is not my table. It's not Bethany's table. It is Christ's table. And it extends through time and place and extends all the way to wherever you are. That your table is an extension of this table, is an extension of the table where we will share in the Feast of the Lamb one day. And so we remember that in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and he broke it, gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks, and he gave it for them all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. There is a place for you at the banquet. Come, feast at Jesus' table. Leaders, take the bread and give it to all who are gathered with you, saying, This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the body of Christ given for you. And if you're worshiping at home today alone, hear me say to you, this is the body of Christ given for you. now take the cup and share it with all who are gathered with you saying this is the blood of Christ shed for you this is the blood of Christ shed for you this is the blood of Christ shed for you May this, the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you always in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, in this simple meal, you have set a banquet. Sustain us on the journey. Strengthen us to care for the least of your beloved children. And give us glad and generous hearts as we meet you on the way. Amen. We sing together, Thine the Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. 
blessing of God, Sovereign, Savior, and Spirit be with you today and always. Amen. Beloved of God, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Again, I thank you for joining in with us today for worship, and as, we have, as has been our practice through this fall, we will now sing the compassion prayer as a blessing for one another. And may you truly find God's love shared with you and shared by you. Ah! 